everyone, and thank you for joining our panel on how to distinguish between green washers and true ESG funds. We would like to make this panel as interactive as possible as it's the last one of the day and of the event. So before we begin, um, by, if anyone's willing, by show of hands, are there any folks here that are focused on ESG investment strategies at their firms? Okay, we have a brave one out there. So, you know, feel free to um, shoot over any questions <laughs> if you'd like to. Um, but I think before um, we kick off with some other topics, I think we should begin with at least defining what ESG means. And so I'd like to hear from my fellow panelists because, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about ESG. There's been a focus in, um, in Europe for many years. Um, in the U.S., there's been a focus. It's catching on more, I would say. And um, I think ESG means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and a lot of different things, you know, within investment strategies. So, um, Juliet, would you like to kick off and tell us what your thoughts are about ESG? Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Juliet Menga. I'm with ATOS Alternatives Management, wide leader ESG efforts. Um, ATOS is a hedge fund advisory slash fund of funds um, that's been around for over 20 years, uh, started by Anne Cassells and Michael Klein. Uh, we manage primar uh, client accounts primarily in custom mandates, but have some commingled products as well. Um, the way we think about ESG is really as a set of uh, data and tools um, for, for us in the way a, in one, the way we think about ourselves as a firm, to be better investors, um, better stewards of capital, and then uh, as a set of data tools that our managers can use to help them make um, invest, uh, good investment decisions in, in the way they think about um, risk uh, management in their portfolio or identifying alpha opportunities. And the way managers typically do that is, I would say, two ways broadly. One is through ESG integration, where they consider material ESG factors as a part of their investment process. And the second is through uh, thematic investments, so in, in uh, themes such as the energy transition or healthcare and, and so forth. And um, lastly, uh, typically um, in, in conjunction with these two broad types of strategies, uh, those in, uh, incorporating ESG would avoid certain companies or sectors either for stranded asset risk reasons um, or value reasons. And some examples of that would be things like firearms or tobacco or coal. So is this mainly driven by certain client requests? Or do you have sort of customized solutions or has it been um, the focus of ATOS? Uh, I would say culturally, ESG has always been the focus of ATOS in, in the way they set up the fund. For example, I think it's very um, unlikely to find a firm where 70% uh, uh, of the employee base is women mm -hmm. or minority for an investment firm. So it's always been a, a key part of our culture. Uh, from an investment perspective, um, we can do it in, in customized mandates, but we also have uh, specific strategies focused on it. Uh, Lionel, how about at your firm? And I know you have a little bit of a different angle. It's more of a PE focus, but we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, thank you, and very nice to, to be with you today. <clears throat> there are similarities, actually, with what uh, Juliet just said, because we, we are also investing in hedge funds. We've been doing that for 25 years. But for us, it means <clears throat> uh, also we are customizing the portfolios for hedge funds. We are doing private debt also. Uh, and for us, ESG means pretty the same as what you described. But there is another dimension I would highlight is the impact investing, which is, to your point, more on private equity. And uh, that was actually a request from our clients. So on our side, ESG has always been an important component of what we were doing. Uh, we are a global firm with very strong US presence, strong European presence. So our friends in Europe were clearly leaders on that, and they helped us, you know, probably... Uh, adopt earlier than our uh, American friends, the, the basic principles of ESG. Uh, we've been a UN PRI signatory for five years. 
But our clients came to us, uh, European clients predominantly, and said we would like to invest in impact investing. And there is a big difference between impact investing and ESG because ESG is more around principles impact. It's about really measuring, assessing the impact if you hadn't been there. So uh, ESG is the way you do things. Impact, if you're not here, what would have happened? And the difference is your impact. And it, that has to be measurable. And in Europe, of course, you see a lot of uh, what is called SFDR, Article 9 funds, much more than here. You see even Article 8 much more. We, we, we estimate that probably in the asset, ma asset management world in Europe, you have close to one third of the funds who are qualifying uh, as Article 8. Uh, it's very difficult to give a precise number, but let's say between 25 and one third, 25% and one third. But impact investing, we've decided to do it uh, by investing in Europe uh, in different countries because it's really uh, very different depending on the type of country you invest and you need diversification what we are offering it's a very high quality access to an asset class I would say uh, uh, to our clients <clears throat> and we have put in place partnerships to independently measure the impact of the companies we invest in versus the objectives they, they are doing so we'll give more details later on but we make a, a, a distinction, and we're not saying one is better, they are just different and very complementary. Okay. So um, I, I do have a question that's, um, you know, for all the panelists, and just very curious because, because you did bring up um, sort of the difference between ESG and impact, and um, very recently there was a piece, I think it was in the Financial Times, that was titled RIP ESG, and it, the tone of the article was, you know, have we distorted what ESG means and do we have to perhaps redefine that? Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, Jake, <laughs> from your perspective as, a, you know, a data provider, um, you know, or data, you know, doing data analytics, like what are, what are your thoughts there about the definition of ESG? Well, it's very nice to be here in person and much like Lionel, uh, our notions around ESG focus on our interactions with our clients. Uh, for the better part of two years, we've been developing our own framework for scoring agency RMBS. And it came from gaps we identified from the existing regulatory bodies, the existing um, government-sponsored enterprises. So ESG to us is really a, about a conversation and engagement with our clients and providing that need. Now, I can't answer that exact question, <laughs> and I, I don't know how it, in fact, it, it, it scopes it out, but I, I think ESG is, keeps evolving, and these notions will keep evolving, so we try to keep flexible and keep those conversations ongoing. So, Ema, you deal with a lot of different asset managers, and your firm has acquired so many different businesses over the years. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, hi everyone, my name is Ima. I uh, co-lead our efforts at Franklin Mutual Series around ESG and sustainability. Uh, our fund has a background in deep value public equities investing. We also do some privates. So I would say, you know, my lens is a bit different because I'm on the public equity side and we also have a deep value investment bias. Um, and if you look at a, a lot of ESG market, it's been a lot more growth kind of uh, driven funds. So. Um, so that's kind of the first thing I'll say. But in terms of RIP ESG, I look at it more as a journey, right? And if you if you look at a lot of people in in, in you know the financial service industry, it's still a very new word. It's new verbiage. Um, so I think it's difficult to have a uh, I guess fight about something that's so new and undefined. But is right? it really new? It's not, but I think the <laughs> emphasis and the awareness of it is new because we are seeing real world effects of us not really considering those things, right? So I think that's the gap is that when I, you know, as I look at this market, I think it's a, it, it's really a mismatch of expectations, right? And I think the clients have a very specific expectation of what sustainability is, even though it's undefined, while the investment industry has a very different idea of how to fit the need to have performance with E, S, and G outcomes. And I think that's where a lot of the regulatory and the guardrails will come in because it will give us you know, room to play depending on where you can optimize when we know, okay, this is what impact means in the market. This is what ESG integrated or ESG focus means in the market. But to get from point A to B is always going to be a journey, right? Because a lot of people 
increasingly realize they have a lot of skin in the game and a lot of at stake to get this done. Um, so it is, it is, you know, it's playing out as I almost expected more or less, right? In the sense of, you know, if you look at a lot of the SEC regulations, et cetera, they're not, you know, some of it is, is, a bit, uh, is a bit more than a lot of the investment folks were looking for, but a lot of it is just what we've been asking from companies for quite a while, and they've been given to us voluntarily, right? When you move that from a voluntary to a mandate, that's different, right? Because now you have liability issues, and I think that's where this stuff is, but I look at it very much in evolution, and I, you know, whether that's ESG, RRI, SRI, impact, et cetera, the idea that, people want their asset managed closer or in line to their values is powerful and I think it really resonates with actual people that are not necessarily in investment seats. Right. I just want to check in with the crowd. Does anyone have any questions or any input? So right now we're focused on our agency efforts and we're using the disclosures straight from the agencies. So we're using it through EMBS, if you're familiar with that, but it's the exact same disclosures that Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny give out. On the non-agency side, we're very fortunate that we collect our own data from uh, servicers and trustees. Did that answer your question? <laughs> oh, oh we're, we're constructing it. So there, there are gaps in the marketplace. Huh, I'm sorry. So give you, I'll, okay, I'll give you an example of a metric we constructed. We, we're, we're tracking counterparties. We, we saw that the CFPB and Ginny, Fannie, Freddie, they weren't really giving transparency around whether a, a counterparty was acting responsibly. So we, we could look at that, and it's gleaned from this everyday available agency disclosures, and one concept was, one, one dimension of our metrics was, is a lender systematically giving rates above and beyond what can be described from the collateral characteristics and the prevailing mortgage rate in the marketplace? So if a lender is doing this, and we're not talking about one or two loans, we're talking about they're doing this across their entire book of business, we're flagging this as some sort of indi indicative of predatory practices, and, and that's what we're pushing into the marketplace as a, a monitoring metric to allow proactive decisions. But I think if you kind of listen to what he said, he's constructing what are gonna be the data sets that are gonna be used in that subsector, right? And I think that's where a lot of the market is, is we're still kind of constructing a lot of the backbone of how we're going to kind of manage this, this place. So, you know, I don't think that, that nuance is kind of comes out in the media or a lot of the articles that are written. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's unfortunate and missed, but you know, over time. Which brings up a really good point with the title of this panel, the, you know, the greenwashing. Is it, you know, are, are these, I guess, there are, I'm sure there are folks out there that are intentionally greenwashing, but um, with, you know, the recent events and, you know, the speculation, the SEC's focus, is it really a point of greenwashing, or in some cases, is it just a lack of knowledge or understanding, or there's still this sort of formation? Um, maybe I'll take a first crack at that. Uh, there is a ton of... Um, not misunderstanding on what ESG is in the, at least if you just look at the headlines. Um, one example of that is, is the focus on ESG ratings, right? So ESG, most ESG ratings, uh, especially from the very big um, data provide the largest ones, will tell you how a company is run. It doesn't necessarily tell you how sustainable that company is um, in terms of, uh, from, a, from a thematic perspective. Uh, for example, um, a firearms company may rank well from an ESG perspective if it treats its employees better <laughs> than other firearms company. So the score itself doesn't really tell you a lot about how sustainable that company is or their impact on society. And I, I think, um, but if you look at the headlines on, on some of this, uh, that's, that's where the focus is. Um, but the issue related to that, I mean, as an industry, we, we haven't done much to help with that because we have all these passive ESG products, right, in, in a world where there are no standard ESG data, in a world where ESG means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
um, and you really have to do the work. So I, 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 I'm a firm believer in that ESG at this point is, is, more, is very leverageable for active managers. It's complex, it's not standard, which means that uh, the managers who go in there and do the work, you, you could identify alpha opportunities or, or have the ability to reduce your risk. Um, but then you really have to, as investors, you have to dig in to understand what the manager is doing to make sure it's in line with your views of ESG. Um, and, but on the other end of it, too, ESG is a space that has grown massively in the last couple of mm -hmm. years. So you have a lot of players that are trying to raise money in the space and are trying to do it easily. So they, there is a combination of greenwashing, mm -hmm. um, but there's also a, a, a lot of misunderstanding of what the sector is or what the data tells you um, in, in a lot of these headlines. Yeah. And I think um, that was part of, I think, that article that yeah. you just mentioned. And so, Lionel, from your perspective, coming from work from the private equity space, um, you know, I, I've yet to see any sort of um, articles on that just yet or about greenwashing, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, more to come, but just would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I would say two things. <clears throat> First, when you invest, you should not rely on what uh, the firm you invest in, the asset management company you invest in tells you. Because you're exposed to not only greenwashing, but even whatever. X washing, Operational Y washing. Exposure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, similarly to Juliet, something where the hedge fund world and the allocators to hedge fund have been pioneers, it's on the due diligence process. And what has uh, happened over the last few years is that there is another dimension to the due diligence that has been implemented. It's precisely the ESG due diligence. And, you know, a firm like Eto seems to be a pioneer. We've been a pioneer as well. Uh, and is it new? I mean, to, to the question, you know, there is something called operational due diligence in the asset owner world. It's very similar to ESG. I mean, there was not the Indeed. E, but there was uh, the G, uh, and you were mm -hmm. really trying to assess if the infrastructure in which the investment professionals were operating was a sustainable one, a risk adverse one, a safe, and so on. So that, that's, that's the first thing I, I would say. And after, of course, it requires a lot of work, a lot of process, a lot of data to be able to assess the, uh, the, the quality of the infrastructure from an ESG perspective. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that's point number one. On your other question, uh, have we seen that or not? I think it's too early to tell. Um, because if you look at the way it works from a regulatory perspective, look at uh, SFDR 8. You self-declare that you are compliant. There is a lot of work, you fill in a lot of papers, but nobody tells you with a stamp, OK, yeah. you are SFDR mm -hmm. Article 8. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course, the European Union says that if people say they were and they are not, they will get fined, but nobody knows. As far as I'm aware, we haven't seen that yet. It's early. And I think that's the role of the investors to assess that, because it's very easy mm -hmm. to identify if a firm is very consistent, serious with this project. I don't think anyone has reached, or perhaps it's a minority uh, of, uh, of actors who have reached a very high level, or impact investment firms have, are an exception to that. But if we focus on Article 8 as opposed to Article 9, it's a travel. You know, it's a journey. And we are, we are at the beginning of this. And <clears throat> what matters to us is not that someone is perfect, because everybody is learning on that. And we want to be part of the ecosystem, help the funds we invest in grow, give them feedback, help them with best practice. And that's what we like. And we try to favor funds as well. We see that the fund focusing 100% on climate change on the credit side. And their role is precisely to help the companies they invest in uh, build a framework, uh, make commitments, engagements in terms of climate change. And actually, you see a virtuous circle between the, between the investor uh, and the firm uh, who receives the capital. So that's why I, I would say it's too early to tell. But it's easy to identify who are the greenwashers or not. I don't think it requires a lot of work. Or So 
I, I'm not very concerned about that. There will be bad actors, but like mm -hmm. you had bad asset managers and. Uh, but, but I do uh, agree with your point about um, making the connection between ESG and operational due diligence. And I've been conducting operational due diligence reviews for my gosh, for 17 so. plus years. <laughs> and um, you know, when we do have, uh, we do a lot of advisory work with our clients. And when we sit down with them and help them to think about how they look at ESG at their company level before, even before they look at the investment strategy level much of our approach is from sort of a due diligence process and an ops due diligence process and asking them those questions and trying to help them connect the dots. So um, it, it, I'm really glad that you made that point. So another point that um, we made earlier, well, Ima, when you and I were speaking, and, um, and I know, Lionel, you, um, you know, said something about, you know, the American friends catching on or, or whatnot, but, um, you know, is the U.S. that far behind? Um, you know, do our you know counterparts in Europe or in the U.K. have it figured out just yet? We'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I'll take that really quickly. Um, I mean, any way you slice it, I think the Europeans are ahead. I think the degree might be overstated. Um, I, I get the sense that we just yes, I saw that last week when I was in London. Yeah. I, I was you know. I was at least pleasantly surprised that they were still questioning, um, you know, some of the approaches, especially with um, SFDR reporting. Yeah. And, I, and I think one thing to keep in mind is, you know, we just, we operate differently, right? The U.S. is more principles-based. Um, but if you look at, you know, there are two ways to think about this. I think one way is if you look at the data on kind of country-level emissions reduction, the U.S. is not far, far, that different than Europe, right? But we just take a different approach to get to that end goal. Um, and that, so I think I think that's kind of how I look at it. Um, there is a gap in education in the U.S. that definitely we're going to mm -hmm. have to catch up on. Um, but one thing that's happening in the space is ESG is becoming a lot more regionalized, right? Because the environmental or social issues in a specific region are very different um, than you know wherever it is that your market is. And I think that's going to be a difficult thing for the space to reconcile. Is we're going to have to make decisions on you know. Do you pursue all jurisdictions? Do you pursue the market where it's most, you know, uh, it matters the most? And, and I think that's just going to have to filter out through the system. Is, is kind of my impression. But I think European American investors that sell into Europe are very much paying attention. And you know, come mm -hmm. August, it's going to be a very big issue for a number of uh, of uh, asset managers. Okay. Jake, any thoughts on this? Not, not on the necessarily the points on Ema just raised, but Julia, Lionel. Julianne, you raised sort of a buyer beware model. And don't you feel that kind of limits the, the, the scope, the scale at which this can go, and makes it much less impactful to the general principles that ESG is trying to accomplish? I, I think that's hard, right, in the sense of we're, we're almost trying to fit in something new into our current model while simultaneously trying to change aspects of that model, right? So it's it's difficult, right? Because I think it probably overshot, right? Where you're trying to build an infrastructure to run a certain strategy or run certain things. Um, but everyone sees the opportunity there, you know, the risk as well, but most people see a lot of opportunity there and everyone rushes into it. So I almost look at it almost like SPACs in the last mm -hmm. year, right? Where everyone said, oh, all I have to do is consider ESG. Cool. I can consider something, right? What does that actually mean? We don't really know. But if that's the threshold, people will play, right? But once you change it, people will then have to adapt to that new threshold. But I don't get the sense that they are, you know, trying to be manipulative or anything. It's just where the space is and what you can get away with. It's kind but of the, the lack of uniformity, the lack of standardization means you can hide almost anywhere. You can you can label things. This greenwashing concept, in many ways, in, in my view, comes about because there really aren't independent assessors, auditors, tying people down to a key set of standards. And of course, I want you to buy my stuff, but whoever the winner <laughs> is, th th those should be the standards, and anyone else who tries to measure it should measure it more or less in the same way. And I think we're going towards that direction, right? I, other than, you know, the SEC stuff is a proposal, right? They, they put out a certain number of things. They're going to get comments, mm -hmm. and hopefully we meet somewhere in the middle. You know, I think, I think an ideal scenario probably is nobody's happy, right? The, the okay. ESG people aren't happy, the non-ESG people aren't happy, and it's somewhere in the middle, right? But, you know, that's my opinion. And uh, to be clear, I think the way you say it, it might look like, oh, there, there are no standards out there. So there is a lot of uh, standard-based organization, right? 
Yeah, there's the, a lot of best practices. The SASB, the GRI, um, the TCFC. So many different frameworks. So there is a ton of frameworks, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I, I would say that the the best, the way we see the best managers integrating, and then there's a ton of uh, third-party data providers, right? So the ones like uh, Leonor mentioned before, it's very easy. If you've been doing this for a while, it's quite quite, it's fairly easy to spot greenwashing. Uh, because the managers uh, that are integrating it well, they're using a combination of these frameworks, um, they're using a combination of these outside vendors and then enhancing it with their own tool and the way they think about investments in a way that is authentic. So between the investment due diligence, between the operational due diligence, um, it's, it's not that hard to spot greenwashing. But like everything else in investments, investments is not easy, right? If it was Back easy, to doing your homework. Be, you have to do your work. You have to, it's not easy. You, ha you have to do the work. There's no way around it. We can't say, uh, it's, we're just not in a, in a position where you say, uh, oh, you integrate ESG, yes, yes or no. It's not a check the box exercise. And there is mm -hmm. just, and I don't think it will be for a while as, as really it shouldn't. But I think a way to protect <clears throat> the investments against this greenwashing is also to test the alignment between the different stakeholders. You know, we've been discussing in the asset management world alignment between GPs, LPs, and, and you have a lot of ways to, to align interest. And I think we are just at the beginning of that. But you know, in the impact investing side, what we've seen, for instance, and it's perhaps easier because to your point when you have hundreds of thousands of data and so on to analyze, to make consistent. That's a different exercise. We, we are not in that world. We are just investing in uh, funds who invest in companies. They don't have 1,000 companies. They might have a portfolio of 15, 20 companies, sometimes a bit more. So you have the depth of the investment. But what is very interesting is to take someone seriously, we, we want to make sure that they are aligned in terms of carry investment, so for instance, in a private equity fund, we want the carry to be conditioned to the achievement of the impact objectives. And that has to be measured independently. So that's the two things. You need to be aligned and you need to have an independent actor. And after, to, to the point of Juliet, yes, you need to do, it's a lot of work, but it's not, the framework has to be uh, that way and it can be very robust. So for instance, in the impact fund on the private equity side, we'll say for each company you invest, let's agree at the beginning on clear objectives. Like, let's take an example. It's a firm, a uh, consulting firm who has uh, an objective to recruit uh, and promote, you know, autistic people, help them in their career. And it's an amazing firm. You know, they've recruited hundreds of autistic people who would not have got a job perhaps in a normal firm, but they are extremely smart uh, and they... They've done a great job. The clients were very happy. But what are the KPIs? How long are they staying? You know, how do you reward them and so on? Uh, how many did you recruit? That's a KPI. At the end of the, um, uh, the fund, the life of the fund, if the KPIs of the different fir firms they have invested in are not achieved, they will not have carry. If they don't achieve 60% of the KPIs, they have zero carry or almost no carry. And that's the way to protect yourself so against the greenwashing. And if someone tells you, no, no, but there is no way, it's like, it's like performance fees. Someone tells you, I don't, I, I don't want performance fees because I don't know if I'm going to perform. That, that's, I think, a way for the industry to evolve in the right direction. So just, please, go ahead. I have not, not specific to commodities. Um, I don't know if anyone well, else. Well, yeah, um, the, we tend to invest in fundamental strategies that are 
primarily in public companies, um, uh, but there are more, I don't, and specific to futures, we haven't really spent a lot of work on that. Um, where I've seen a lot of work done, not me personally, is on uh, sovereign ratings. Um, the, the World Bank has a framework that a lot of managers are using as a starting point. And um, tied to futures, I've seen some managers, and I think that's still in the beginning stages, uh, tie uh, that sovereign rating to the uh, origin of whatever features they're looking at as a way to think about ESG. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, before we wrap up, I just um, have a question in regard to sort of the cost around implementing an ESG strategy. And, um, you know, there's data providers, there's you know, systems or technology for keeping track of data. There's a lot of, I've seen with my clients, um, and a lot of them I would say in the VC space, tend to get these questionnaires from investors that are, you know, asking questions of them as the or at the organizational level, also of their underlying portfolio companies. And oftentimes these are groups of five to ten individuals and they don't have, you know, the resources. Is, I mean, is implementing an ESG type investment strategy expensive for a fund manager or an investment firm? I think today it is. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's like any cost curve, right? I think as you come out of the gate and you're trying to kind of build that infrastructure, it's going to be expensive. Um, I think this is one of the downsides of the heavy regulatory approach that Europe has taken, right? Is that it probably helps incumbents more so than it helps some of the, you know, medium and smaller players, at least today. Um, but you can also make the argument that being a fast second mover is also a smart strategy and letting people make those mistakes um, and figure it out ahead of you. Um, but it is costly and I think a lot of folks have underestimated that cost. But what I will say is that you have to think about cost short term, medium term, long term, right? Is it worth the cost to try to implement these things if they're going to have some kind of impact today versus waiting for those kind of shocks or supply chain shocks or climate shocks down the line? I think that's really the debate, but you know, a lot of our cost function is a lot more short term, right? Because you need to manage your costs in the short term to get to the medium to the long term. So I think that is, that is a issue in this space. Um, but it's like everything else, right? Every time we have some new regulation, there's always a discussion around cost, mm -hmm. and somehow, some way, we make our way through. So that's kind of my two cents. So for, from a vendor perspective, uh, right now it is institutional size and expense, and we, you know, we, we have to recoup our R&D, and I, I actually think it's gonna get worse, it get more expensive, because the initial players are trying to capture market share and they're subsidizing. So I don't see how small family offices, how, uh, small hedge funds actually incorporate this as a first order priority. Yeah. No, there, there is definitely a cost, but I, I think you should look at the benefit also. Because if you look at the cost in an isolated fashion, of course you, you would not do it. But it's true, it's, it's expensive in terms of resources, systems, and time, as you said, sometimes for small, small firms. The feedback we got from a, for instance, uh, the hedge fund manager, we, we see that very engaged on that, on the credit side, uh, is precisely the feedback they receive from the corporates they invest in. But that's why it's an ecosystem also. Uh, and people help each other, and th what they do, they do an amazing job, for instance, speaking with the CFOs, the companies, provide resources to them, help them put in place a framework that is not necessarily very expensive, but they also give resources to them knowledge, know-how, and, and resources and time. So that's one, one aspect. The, the second one is that comes from the top on the benefit side. Because I think the same way we were discussing factor investing 10 years ago, 
It was extremely expensive from a risk management perspective to analyze all the factors, the systems, are you long momentum, long value? Uh, and now it's a given. If you don't have it, you're out of the business. You don't do business anymore. Uh, and of course, you had uh, also economies of scale, and uh, it's, uh, it's much cheaper than 10 years ago to access the technology to do it. But I think we will most likely be in the same situation in five, 10 years. If you don't have a minimum set of criteria on the way you run your business from an ESG perspective, impact is different because again, that's a, a, a specific asset class. But on the, in the ESG side, I think you will be out of the business. So there is a cost. It will help you raise assets as an asset management firm, definitely, because you look at Europe, the, the inflows have been massive. Hence your question on greenwashing, it's to capture this that you have to be suspicious because there are so many inflows that people don't want to put the cost in front of the benefits, definitely. But I think that ultimately that will be a prerequisite also to do business with serious investors. Yeah, I completely agree. And I would even go as far as to say for some um, consulting group or some organizations, um, if you are not, especially in Europe, um, I just had a conversation with a very large consulting group um, in the U UK not too long ago that have as signatories to the net zero asset management, uh, well, consulting group. And um, starting next year, they will be redeeming from the managers that do not have a minimum ESG set of criteria. So it's, I, I think it's not even five to 10 years from now it's happening. Um, so is it expensive? Uh, yes, but like <laughs> anything new. And um, it's a cost of doing business. It's, it's becoming the, the, I think the cost of doing business is expensive in general. Mm -hmm. And um, from the data standpoint, actually, there is a lot of, um, it, you know, if you think about your technology tools or whatever other tools you use to make your, inform your investment decision, um, that should kind of be in line in, line in terms of the expense. Okay. Just want to check in with the crowd. Any questions, comments? Well, um, so, right, so, right, um, well, I, frankly, we don't even need to dig into specific ESG concerns um, to, be, to have to fire a manager who has good performance. Um, if you have good performance and uh, we, we think uh, there are ethical issues <laughs> in terms of cultural issues, for example, we will let you go. <laughs> Um, so, so, so that's, uh, you know, there is a minimum standard for, for behavior or, or there is a change in, in the strategy in the way that we did not underwrite, um, and, um, that we think is quite different from what we underwrote as a strategy and we're not comfortable with the set of people that are, um, uh, taking care of it going forward. And that's a good example to, to let go, even if performance is good. So there are many reasons, including ESG reasons, why we might get out of a manager um, that, uh, that may be doing well, uh, uh, because if, if we don't think uh, going forward, it's a, it's a good fit uh, for, for our portfolios. Um, on the flip side, I like to say that we, we underwrite, from an investment perspective, we underwrite our managers to the same ES, um, investment standard uh, for, for all our funds um, from an investment perspective. Uh, we, don't, we do not believe that you need to uh, give up returns to, to incorporate ESG. In fact, it might be flipping the other way. Um, if you are in certain sectors, for example, um, anything related, relating to the energy transition, and you're not thinking about some of those issues, you're probably not a good steward of capital. 
Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you.